Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live. And tonight, our guest is Stephen Kruger, Coach Ben from Yellow Jacket. Stephen, thank you for being here with us. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Uh, this is very exciting. A lot of people have been looking forward to this. Uh, first <laughs> of all, congratulations on the renewal of Yellow Jackets. Uh, thank you. I mean, we as fans, we saw it coming. If Showtime did not renew it, then somebody needed to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hit show. It's a great show. And it's still catching on. In fact, I would say now that the first season is completed, viewership is growing even more and more as word of mouth starts to spread about the show. But as an actor, coming on to a brand new show, first season, of course, there's no guarantees. You don't know what's going to happen. Walk us through that moment when you find out that your show has been picked up for another season. Yeah, it was exciting. You know, actually, I remember the exact moment I was in. Um, I was actually in Florida visiting my family uh, over the holidays, um, kind of right before Christmas, and we were at Disney World. Um, we had taken my my two year old niece to Disney World for her first trip there, and um, I started getting you know texts from our producers, and then you know the headlines started coming through on all the social media. So um, I had kind of been tipped off right you know about a week or so before that that it was that it was looking good, and then an announcement was imminent. Imminent, but um, it's exciting. You know, I think I think going into the first season it was weird because the timeline was so much different than any other show i've done where mm -hmm. you know we were very disrupted by the pandemic as i know a lot of shows were um we shot the pilot at the end of 2019 yep. and then uh didn't get the first season pick up until the very end of 2020 and didn't start shooting the first season until you know half about halfway through 2021 so mm -hmm. it was like a full year and a half from when we finished the pilots when we started shooting the rest of season one which is which is very rare um you know usually it doesn't take nearly that long so i think we were all really really grateful to to kind of have that chemistry and um and just be able to pick up right where we left off after the pilot and, and make a great first season and Absolutely. believe me none of us know what's going to happen in season two um my, myself included so i think we're all excited to see where we're headed i had sophie on a couple of weeks ago and she yeah. said the exact same thing uh was there a time on the set while you guys were filming that you said to yourselves you know what we got something special here this is this is there's a chance this could be really great. You know, it, there were, I mean, the funny thing is it went in cycles. I think we all, we all went through, and I don't know if we were just psychologically drained at a certain points because, you know, again, the, the conditions under which we shot the first season were pretty, pretty unique and pretty rare. Um, mm -hmm. We were in Vancouver and of course the Canadian border was closed because of, because of COVID and the totally. pandemic. So, um, you know, we were all kind of stuck there together in this, you know, ostensibly a foreign country, which it is. Um, and we couldn't really go anywhere. We couldn't really have anybody come visit us. So we kind of had nobody but each other. And it was very taxing, you know, it was, it was difficult circumstances to shoot under. Um, and I think we went in these, these weird waves where we went from thinking, oh my God, this show is going to be so great. And then we would have weeks where I literally remember talking to, to some of the rest of the cast where we thought, man, the show might really suck. Like we really, we really did. We went through, I mean, we went through full circles of like, this show is going to be great. The show is going to be terrible. And I think by the end, none of us truly had any idea, you know, when we had finished the show and, and wrapped up, we thought, I mean, I guess we'll see, you know, I guess we'll see how the audience responds, but we really, we really didn't know. We knew certainly that there were great elements to it. And I think we were just questioning whether it would find, you know, the, the right audience. And, um, obviously I think pleasantly yes. surprised by the, by the reaction. Absolutely. We're going to get back to yellow jackets in just a few minutes, but yeah. this is not your first go round on a hit show. Uh, you were in the originals. You started yeah. out as a reoccurring character. And then finally in the last season, season five, you were made a regular. Was your yeah. reaction like, Finally. <laughs> kind of. I mean, one of the weird things is like it was we had kind of had discussions about it um, before, you know, in, in seasons leading up to that final season. And uh, I actually liked I, I really did enjoy being a recurring character on the show because it kind of gave me the freedom to go and do other stuff. You know, I wasn't necessarily tied down as much as I, I loved working on that show. So I never really pushed that hard for it. Um, and then when we got to the final season, it just kind of made sense. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we were, knew we were doing one more season. Uh, there wasn't anything else I was going to do for those, you know, six months or so that we were shooting that final season. And I really wanted to be there, um, to kind of close out the series. And, you know, the funny thing about the originals is when I first booked that job and, and I, and I had this role, 
I was initially told that it was going to be three or maybe four episodes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think their, their original storyline was, uh, I come in, you know, some stuff happens. I get my head cut off after a few episodes and, and, you know, like so many other, you know, characters on that show do. And, uh, and that would be the end of it. And I think when I got there, you know, a couple episodes in, we all just kind of realized that, that something worked, you know, something about the character clicked, it fit in really well with, with the rest of the cast. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just ended up turning into a, a full five season long arc, um, which I really enjoyed. And your character, Josh became a fan favorite from very, very early on, which is why, yeah. you, know, you know, they decided not to kill you off. You explained how you liked the freedom to be the reoccurring character to go out and do, other stuff when they came to you and said you know are you interested in becoming a regular in the final season was it a no-brainer or did you have to really debate it for a while to come to a decision no no at that point it was a no-brainer you know i knew we were doing one more season um i i really really wanted to be there with you know with the whole cast for the full final season so at that point you know it was it was no questions whatsoever i uh, i was in and i was happy to kind of close out the series with the with the rest of the cast because you know i was i was there from pretty much the beginning okay. so it was really fun to kind of bring it full circle what was it like being on a you know a show based on vampires on on tv on the cw was it a completely new experience for you at the time oh yeah yeah absolutely at the time i mean i had i certainly had no experience with honestly any kind of you know any kind of supernatural mm -hmm. um type show you know characters um there was a you know there was certainly a learning curve i think in, in two different ways number one um you know this show was a spin-off of the vampire diaries of course mm -hmm. which was a, a massive hit massive, at the time yeah. um and so i had to i had really had to spend some time kind of going back and watching vampire diaries and learning some of the mythology because i very quickly learned just how fanatical the uh, <laughs> the audience was for these two shows as far as the mythology goes and you know when you would go to some of these fan conventions or you would interact with people online I mean, they would ask questions, very specific questions about, you know, how does becoming a vampire work? You know, how do vampires and werewolves interact? What happens when a vampire is bit by a werewolf? All this stuff that I really had no idea about. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of trippy and, and, and really fun to kind of explore that world and just and just become more immersed in it so that, you know, I could kind of get on the same page as all the all the fans were. And then, you know, there's a lot of physical stuff from an acting perspective that I had to learn as well, you know, things about how to you know how to do the right movements when your neck gets snapped i mean that was something that i honestly worked on through the entire time when we had stunt coordinators and they would kind of walk you through you know when somebody snaps your neck and kind of the movement that you have to do without hurting yourself to, but to also make it look real and um things like you know we did um we called it vamping on the show where you know vampires kind of move faster than everybody else yeah. they can move kind of at lightning speed and just just the logistics behind how you film something like that you know everybody freezes on set and then you know you kind of walk at a very intentional pace and then they do all of that in post but yeah it was it was a really interesting world and, and i'm glad that i have that experience because there's so many of those shows on on tv and mm -hmm. so many movies out there right now that that you know used out that supernatural stuff so i'm glad that i have that experience because it makes it a lot easier for uh for other projects that is so awesome now josh was a very unique character uh you were a uh, part of the lgbt community on the show yep uh very great representation as your time on the show from the beginning as the years went on did you find that the writers were writing around you yourself on how you can portray Josh uh, more accurately? And did they give you any kind of input on how to portray Josh? Well, basically, you know, so they, did you have any input on how you wanted to portray Josh? I had a lot. I mean, honestly, they, they gave me a lot of creative license, which I really appreciate. And I think that's one of the reasons that I that I really enjoyed working on the show. I mean, our, our showrunners through the whole thing, you know, Julia Pleck and, and Michael Narducci, um, they were great about, you know, when I first came in, it was pretty clear what the character was. Um, he was supposed to be this kind of newbie vampire, you know, didn't have a whole lot of power, was kind of getting kicked around a lot. But he also had these, these great comedic elements as well. And, and the thing that I really liked about Josh from the absolute get go is number one, he he was one of the first LGBT characters in the Vampire Diaries universe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they they had one or two, I think, in, in Vampire Diaries at some point. But Josh was kind of one of the most prominent ones from from the get go. Um, but the character wasn't solely there just to kind of check the box of let's make sure we have an LGBT character in this in this universe and in this show. It was one of his many personality traits. And I think that's what I always appreciated about the character is, you know, they treated him like a normal three dimensional human being, which which all characters 
from any ethnicity, any sexual orientation. That's that's really how they should be treated. You know, this is one element of their personality, one element of their character. Um, and so while they, you know, paid attention to that and they certainly wrote storylines for that in season two when they gave me a love interest, um, it was always just part of who I was. And I had a lot of other stuff going on as well. So I really, I really appreciated that element of it, that it wasn't just about representing LGBT community. Mm -hmm. um, and and they, they were great. I mean, they kind of let me take the character and run with it. And I think that's honestly why it ended up working so well. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't put a lot of constraints on me about, you know, this is what we're looking for as far as bringing another element into the show. I, they just kind of let me go. And sure enough, it, it kind of clicked and it just fit in with everything else that was going on in the show. Absolutely. Do you credit the Vampire Diaries uh, with playing a major role in you getting the role on Yellow Jackets? I do uh, for for a very specific reason, and, and the reason is because I met the writers of Yellow, the creators of Yellow Jackets on uh, the originals. Oh. Um, so Ashley Lyle and Bart Nickerson, um, they were writers on the originals from season one through season three, um, nice. and that was actually their first writing job. Uh, as they're they're a they're a couple, they're a husband and wife, and um, and they were basically a writing team, and they were staff writers on the originals, and I got to know them really well on that show. Um, and I always just vibed with them. You know, we, we always got along really well. I always really looked forward to the episodes that they were writing specifically because I knew that they were going to write great stuff for my character. Um, you know, those two, Ashley and Bart, along with, with Karina McKenzie and a couple of the other writers in the room, you know, I really credit them with, with why I was on the originals for so long. Cause I know, you know, it's funny to hear in retrospect, all the debates that were going on in the writer's room that I wasn't privy to at the time. Um, but there was a lot of like, Hey, you know, this Josh character really works. I think we need to keep him around for a while. And then, you know, there'd be the other half that says, well, you know, I think we can, I think we can lose him. And so, you know, Ashley and Bart were always, were always two of the writers that kind of always had my characters back and said, no, 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 we need, we need more Josh. We need to keep him around. And so I really bonded with them over those first three seasons. And then, um, when they left the originals after, I think after season three, um, and they went to work on Narcos, um, mm -hmm. You know, it was it was disappointing and it was sad because I, I knew I was losing some of my favorite writers on the show. Um, but I remember when they left, they said, hey, you know, we'll see you again. We'll work together again. I didn't know that it was going to be so soon. Um, I mean, literally a couple of years later, this script comes into my my email inbox and it says Yellow Jackets and it says written by Ashley Lyle and Bart Nickerson. And I thought, there you oh, my go. God, oh, well, there, there you, you go. go. They have they have a thing. So, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is it's it's directly related to why I ended up in Yellow Jackets. And that is such an asset because when writers, when a new show is being developed and you have a writing team and then you the actors and everything the writers want to learn uh, not, not just the character they're creating but the person who's going to be playing that character so yeah. having that prior knowledge of you uh man you can't quantify that that is invaluable to have that for them to know you and basically create ben around you yeah yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's it, it, it's one of those Hollywood tropes that you always kind of hear when you're starting out, you know, this business is all about relationships, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure you've heard oh, it a yeah. ton before, you know, anybody in this industry, you kind of, you're, 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 you're told that so often, and it's kind of preached nonstop. And I think when I was first starting out, I, I, I didn't, I'm not sure how much I bought it, I guess is what I'm what I'm getting at. Um, and really, in the last five or six years or so, it's become very apparent that that is that is true. You it's know, all about so much of this business is about yeah, and it and it's about being a good person and making sure that when you do work with people, you have a pleasant working experience. Especially, I mean, especially given the last couple of years and what we've all gone through with the pandemic, mm -hmm. and you know, productions having to have all these new protocols and and all these safety restrictions, and people just want to work with with other creative people. A that they get along with. B that they know we're not going to be any trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and C that they that they know we're going to show up and, and do a great job every day. So. Yeah, that's um, that's been a really important thing, and I'm, I mean, I'm eternally grateful to to Ashley and Barb for bringing me on board Yellow Jackets because, uh, you know, here we are. Here you are now. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You were raised, grew up, born in Wisconsin, yeah, and then you moved to. Is it Appleton, Wisconsin? Yeah, Appleton, Wisconsin. Is where okay, I, was born, I, I just gotta I lived, say a little uh, side note. My oh, wife's please. family is from Appleton. I visited. No way. Yeah, I visited Appleton plenty of times. It's a great town. <laughs> they love their Packers uh, yeah, up there. Do. But damn, Stephen, it's cold. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I went from one extreme to the other. I went from Wisconsin to Florida. So, uh, yeah, from very cold to very hot. 
Uh, would your love for acting, has it always been there? Did it happen when you moved to Florida? Did going to Florida was for the purpose not only to get out of the cold, but to pursue your acting career further? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Um, my The origin story of my acting career is kind of this this beautiful, poetic, full circle kind of thing because um, I honestly was, was kind of pushed into acting by my mother um, mm. when I was a freshman in high school. Um, the, the story essentially goes, I had, you know, one kind of extra class that I could sign up for my first year of, of high school. Um, and, you know, I wanted to take something stupid like gym so I could just kind of screw around. Um, and I very distinctly remember my mother saying, I think you should take, uh, acting, you know, they had a, a really good acting class at this high school that I went to. And she said, I think you'd really enjoy it. And I, I had no interest whatsoever. Um, but she kind of forced me to do it. And sure enough, from, from day one of stepping into this acting class in high school, I absolutely loved it. Um, I, I, I couldn't believe how right my mother was and how wrong I was. Um, and then I ended up losing my mom when I was 18 years old, uh, when I was in my first year of college. So, um, you know, I always think about the fact that she probably didn't realize she was pushing me into an actual career. Um, think and, of how proud you know, she, she would be. She yeah, is, yeah, know? I do. I, I think I think about that often. You know, I'm, I'm sure she's watching from from wherever she is. And um, I, I think that she would be really happy with the, the fact that I ended up pursuing this as an actual career. <laughs> That is so awesome. Uh, I'm so sorry about your mom. So when the script of Yellow Jackets arrived and you saw the writers, you knew them. I'm assuming it was just for the pilot episode. Uh, it was. I got to admit, when I started watching Yellow Jackets and I saw the pilot and we were sort of introduced to you, I'm like, this guy is a one episode, two episode. He's an he's the assistant coach. He's going to yeah. die in that plane crash. But no, yeah. that's not what happened. It was the complete opposite. So what were your feelings on that pilot and the script in particular? Well, two things. Number one, um, just in a general sense, the, the script for the pilot was truly, and I, I feel like people say this a lot, but I, I mean it in every sense. It was one of the best pilots I had read, honestly, ever. Um, it was, I, I know how Ashley and Bart write, and it was just, it was so beautifully written. They had created such a rich world and such a unique idea and it was captivating it was like it was like reading a novel i mean i i flipped through the thing in probably 30 minutes and read every word and i was just i thought immediately like oh my god this is this is special like this is something that's really really special i haven't read anything like this um and i was immediately hooked and sold um funny enough what you saw in the pilot that we actually shot is quite different from what the original script was okay. um there was a whole storyline that um that coach ben basically was in with another female teacher um, in the pilot. And so there were there were a lot of additional scenes. Um, in fact, uh, you know, for uh, hopefully no spoilers here, but for people that have watched the show, you know that uh, Coach Ben is, is also revealed as being gay and closeted in uh, the later half of the season. Yeah. Um, that was initially revealed in the pilot in kind of a in kind of a really interesting way where he goes on a date with this female teacher um, because she has a crush on him and he's you know he's closeted and he's trying to keep his cover um, and then it's revealed kind of right before he gets on the plane that morning to to leave for the tournament um, that he actually lives with with his partner and and has a gay relationship um, so because of just some casting issues and and time issues and whatnot a lot of the, almost all of that ended up getting cut from the pilot and so it got really trimmed down to you know kind of what you saw in the pilot and I remember during during that summer of 2020 um ashley and bart kind of got in touch and they said hey listen you know the way things are going we're really having to cut some stuff down and cut it out of the pilot um you know don't be scared you know you're not going anywhere um but you definitely won't see yourself in the pilot quite as much as as you had thought initially yeah. so and i you know i mean here's the thing i think as an actor you you know that that stuff happens mm -hmm. um it happens to all of us you know uh, things get cut for one reason or another and it's and it usually has nothing to do with you know the performance that you gave or the actor behind it or anything like that so um i think in a way it's it's almost more fun this way because of exactly what you said right it's like I people agree. see that pilot and they think oh hey here's yeah. this like small character and you know he's going to be dead really quickly and then all of a sudden it's like oh wait nope this this guy's going to be around for a while and he actually has some stuff to say exactly agree and as i'm watching it and you survived a plane crash minus a le minus minus a, a leg yeah, yeah. And as it, I'm still thinking, okay, this guy's going to maybe go another episode. And then I'm like, and then your character kept evolving and evolving throughout the first season to the major, one of the major players in the end. Uh, when you got that script, did, since you just got the pilot, 
did you know that, that you know if the pilot got picked up you were going to go for more than just one or two episodes did they give you I, a timeline? i did yeah yeah because i i signed on initially as a as a series regular so okay. i i did know that that you know that uh coach ben was going to be there um for you know the entirety of the of the first season and of course that's that's pretty much all i knew you know okay. i think i think everybody went into this show knowing okay well we're here for a season at least. And then I think after, you know, after that first season, it's like all bets are off. Yeah. You know, I think, I think outside of those core four girls who we know survive because they have all the counterparts, everybody else is kind of like, well, my time could be up at any, at any point. And it wouldn't surprise me. Like I told Sophie, uh, the people that we have not seen in the present day, uh, 2021 from 1994 mm -hmm. coach Ben being one of them, people may naturally assume that he died somewhere in 1994 and yeah. me and sophie had this, this this discussion when she was on here no it would not surprise me as the season go as it goes into season two or maybe even season three that we find out that coach ben is still alive and just mm -hmm. living in some area you know traumatized and mentally screwed up like all the rest of them are would it surprise you it wouldn't. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I don't think anything would surprise me at this point. I'm, I've, I've learned that Ashley and Bart have incredibly twisted minds. Um, I, I have come to, and I always tell people this about the show. I always say expect the unexpected um, because you just don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what kind of twists and turns they're going to be. And I think the beauty about the way they set this show up is, you know, they have a general idea for, for the story arc, right? Mm -hmm. Where they want it to go over the course of, of four or five seasons. I think they initially planned it to be five seasons. Um, and within that, you know, within that broader story arc, there's a lot of flexibility, you know, they can, they can kind of adjust things. They can go in a lot of different directions. They can see what's working and what's not. And I think that's why we're, even as a cast, we're all excited to see where it goes because, you know, we, we really don't know and they can go in so many different directions and there can be a lot of surprises even for us, you know, we're working yeah. on the show every day. Uh, so you're like kind of a viewer of the cast since you don't know what's going to happen in season two. I mean, I'm sure you guys are anxiously waiting for those scripts to arrive. Oh, John. Oh, you have no idea. We, we, it was, it was one of the funniest things about shooting the first season is like, you know, they were, they were writing the scripts, of course, as we were shooting, you know, we, they were, they were about four or five scripts ahead. And, um, we would just, I mean, every single actor was waiting, you know, once we get, we would, we would get towards the end of filming one episode and it would be like, when's the next episode coming? When are we getting the next episode? And some people were more anxious than others. I was always kind of like, hey, you know what? It'll get here when it gets here. But some, I mean, some of the cast, they were just ravenous when it came to when is the next script coming? And so, you know, that next script would land in our inboxes. And it was like, we were all sitting on set, just scrolling through our laptops or our phones, just reading, you know, to see what happened next. So yeah, I mean, it, it was it was fun to experience that because I think that's probably what the audience experienced too in this first season. Oh yeah. Now, how difficult was it for you as an actor having to play somebody who lost their leg? Uh professionally job wise to make people believe that you've lost a limb uh and bringing that to the screen was that very challenging for you as an actor yeah it was that was i have to say that was probably the thing that i focused on the most um you know because obviously it's the most it's the most foreign to me you know as as far as an actor goes and and especially you know in this era that we're living in when representation matters so much mm -hmm. you know we're we're finally getting to the point where um, representation of, of diverse groups and minority groups is, is, is be actually, you know, finally being seen. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, there's always the movement out there where people would want, if, if there was an amputee character, want, want that to be played by an actual amputee. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if they auditioned any actual amputees for that role or not, but I did feel a really big sense of responsibility, you know, obviously being, um, not an amputee to figure out, what is that like, you know? And so I think that's where the majority of my research went into a couple things. One, obviously the physical elements of it, right? You know, what is it physically like to have to adjust to moving around with, with only one leg? Um, what does that do to your body? You know, what does that do to the way that you move? Um, and the, the, the pain threshold and the pain tolerance, all that kind of stuff. And then of course the, the bigger element almost is the psychological and the mental element that comes into it. You know, what does this do to your psyche? Um, what, you know, when you look down and you see that you only have one leg and you see people looking at you, what is, you know, what is that experience like? So I put a lot of time into kind of researching amputation. I mean, I was, 
I went down a lot of, of Reddit rabbit holes um, and, and just listened to people's stories. I watched YouTube videos. Um, I got in touch with a couple of amputees to, to ask them what their experiences were like. And I, I, I try to do my best to kind of portray that in as authentic a way as possible. Um, but that, that is the biggest element of my character that I, that I put the most work into before we started. And I think you did a great job, in particular when uh, Misty, we'll get to her in a second, when she chopped your leg off and you were in the initially just self-pity you know basically you know i'd rather die i don't want to live like this my leg is gone was that a part of the research you did and really helped you to because man you really hit a chord you really brought it you you didn't leave anything on the table you brought it all and it really yeah. came through and do you credit all the research you did for that yeah, yeah, I do. And, and, I, and I appreciate that. I, um, yeah, that was one of the things that, that I learned is, you know, I think anybody who suffers a traumatic injury, whether it's an amputation or otherwise, you know, what I, one of the things that I learned was you, you do go through this, this period of, of depression almost. Yeah. yeah Self-pity, you know, you see yourself as a victim and, and, and that was kind of one of the common threads of, among all the stories and, and everything that I, that I watched and read and listened to. Um, it, that was the common thread that you do go through this period of self-pity and this, this, this period of depression before you kind of learn to accept what you've been through and, and accept what you are now. And, yeah. and the fact that you are still a person who can achieve a lot of things. And, um, yeah, that was, that was one of the things that stuck out to me for sure. And also that scene where Misty chops the leg off, you know, she does it to save your life. But that is our first indication as viewership that Misty is a psychopath. And she is. She uh, she is this little me, quiet person before the accident, after the accident, when everything's in chaos. It's like that's her world, you know, where she, a world where she can thrive in mm -hmm. uh, a world of chaos, no organization, no adults telling her what to do. Do you agree with that analogy? And that was the pivotal moment when uh, she had to chop off your leg? Yeah, I mean, I really do. I think I think that that's one of the, the beautiful things about Missy's character arc, right, is you, you see and I think we're going to see even in more flashbacks probably in, in the next season of you know, Misty was always an outcast um, and she's all of a sudden needed, you know, in this very, very dire circumstance. And she likes that, you know, yeah. she likes that feeling of control. She likes that feeling of power um, and she kind of embraces it. And I think that that ends up being what guides her through a lot of her actions. You know, I mean, even even you see a few episodes in when when Ben starts to become a little bit more self-reliant, you know, he's he's found these these crutches that he's kind of whittled into into crutches to help him help him move around without Misty's help. And she doesn't like that, you know, and there's that scene in the episode where she, she trips him intentionally to kind of put that self doubt back into his head and say, Oh, you know what, maybe I do need her. So, you know, it's I think like that misery, that's, the movie misery. You know? It's exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and they, and they did, they mentioned that when we, when we first started, they said, you know, there's a, there's a lot of elements of, of misery with your guys' relationship here. And I, I thought, you know, I had a, I had a great time with Samantha Hanratty playing with that and, and just kind of, you know, playing off of each other and, um i do think that that's going to continue you, you know, guys in, have in great next chemistry. season you guys have great yeah we chemistry. had a great time now uh you know as you are the adult in that group okay you are the only adult <laughs> but you sort of become to see them as your peers as being the one in charge and telling them what to do uh was that intentionally written in the script as each episode progressed? Uh, did you have any input on that? Do you like that? Do you like the fact that Ben sees the girls as more of his peers rather than adult that has to take care and lead them? Well, the interesting thing about that, to answer your question, yes, that was very intentional. That was one of the things that, that we talked about before we even started shooting the season that, you know, there's going to be this arc where Coach Ben goes from you know, being the only adult and kind of the authority figure and, you know, the leader of the group who they're all looking to for, for guidance and, and help to all of a sudden he's slowly losing his power, you know, over the course of the season. And he starts to realize that these girls aren't going to listen to him. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple times throughout that first season when logic is, is so clear, you know, to, to Ben and probably to the audience. I think that Ben ends up kind of being a, a conduit for the audience where they say, you know, uh, Laura Lee, 
do not get in this plane that's been sitting here in these weeds for the last however many years and try to fly the thing. You know, yeah. that's that's insane. And and Coach Ben gets shut down very quickly. You know, in the finale episode, no, Jackie is not going to go sleep outside. Shut up, Coach. You have no power here anymore. So that was a that was a really fun element to play, and it's something that you know if you think about what would happen in that in that circumstance it's pretty true to life, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these girls are the ones that, you know, they're the team, they're the ones who are bonded together. And anybody who's not part of that is eventually going to become an outcast. And so I think coach realizes that he's slowly losing his power and he kind of has to figure out how to deal with that. And one of the most interesting things to me was inevitably he still feels that sense of responsibility, right? Like that's never going to go away, whether they're listening to him or not. Yeah. I don't think that coach Ben is ever going to abandon that sense of, Hey, I'm responsible for, for these young girls. You know, imagine if we get rescued, yeah. which who knows, maybe we do, maybe we don't, but imagine if we get rescued and how am I going to explain all of this stuff that's happened? Mm -hmm. You know, when they say coach, you know, how could you not have, have stopped that girl from getting in the plane and blowing herself up? I kind of have a lot to answer for, you know, yeah, when it comes to things adult. like that. So, yeah, exactly. It's you know, it's it's going to be very tough to explain to people back in the real world what the dynamics were out in out in the woods when we were stuck out there, and and how I managed to lose all of my authority and all of my power. So, I think even though that that's what's happening, I still think I feel this deep sense of responsibility, and that's that's a really interesting juxtaposition, and I think something that I'm going to continue to deal with in, in the next season. And that's the whole premise of the show because the pilot it starts off with people being interviewed about the, the trailer and nobody really knows because they all kept their mouth shut after they got rescued right. they don't want to talk about it and as the coach if coach ben is still alive in 2021 uh you know and as the relationships progressed in 1994 there are all sorts of possibilities did you get into a relationship with one of the girls right and then being accused of it being inappropriate i mean it just goes on and on and on uh um, yep you and misty the 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 chemistry the relationship between ben and misty do you think ben is uh i know he doesn't like misty he finds her annoying but i love coach ben oh shut up misty you know uh, do you think that ben is afraid of misty uh, that if he sort of really rejects her she is capable of physically hurting him I do. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a fine line, right? I think we, we saw in, uh, I can't remember exactly which episode, I think it was episode, episode five when, um, you know, she, she kind of poisons him mm -hmm. with, uh, with that soup and, and he kind of vomits and he confronts her and, and ends up having to find this very clever way of appeasing her by kind of telling her that he has feelings for her as well. I think yeah. there is an element of, you know, I, I, I worry about what she'll do. Um, am I worried at this point that she's going to kill me? Probably not. That's probably still a ways off. But I do worry that she is not thinking clearly. I do worry that, you know, she has this obsession. And if that's left unchecked, um, it could, you know, it could really get out of hand. So spiral. yeah, that's I think it could absolutely spiral. And I think that that's something that's always in the back of my mind. Um, you know, just tread lightly, you exactly. know, try to appease her. And, and, you know, that's another that's another really cool arc that we had in the show where I kind of go from attempting to do that to by the end of the season, it's like, the, you know all bets are off mm -hmm. screw you like get out of my face get away from me yeah. um you know all the niceties are gone yeah. for, for pretty much everybody by the end of the season so again i think that's going to be a really interesting thing that we explore in season two of like now what exactly. you know now do i have to be on guard all the time probably and also now speaking of the future season season two and possibly beyond we as the audience have come to expect ben to be the good guy the guy you know who what if you get that script and you find out that the writers start to take Ben down a dark path? Because we know the girls splinter, okay? They, they through the little flashback, not all the flashbacks, and the little segments that we see even beyond where the season ended, and we start seeing them wearing the, the costumes, the, mm -hmm. the, all that occult ritualistic stuff. If Ben does get taken down a dark path, uh, would you be in favor of that if they do take Ben in that direction? Or would you prefer for Ben to be sort of a guiding light the way he's trying to become at the, by the end of season one? 
It's a great question. I, I think that it could be interesting either way, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, I kind of see the merits of him going down a slightly darker path because, you know, how long can he really hang on to letting these girls do pretty much whatever they want, even mm -hmm. when it's clearly the wrong thing? You know, I mean, at some point, I would imagine Ben kind of says to himself in, in his inner monologue, you know, screw these little bitches, <laughs> you know, part of my language, <laughs> yeah. but like, screw them. Like I, you know what, I've got to take matters into my own hands. I have to get through to them somehow. And how that manifests, I think would be a really, really interesting story to tell in the, in the second season and beyond. So, um, I am curious, I'm, I'm very curious where they're going to go with, with Ben and, and just how, you know, just, just how much he wants to challenge some of these girls that have stood up to him. Absolutely. Now the cannibalism, which we did not see in season one, but we know mm -hmm. is coming uh, do you play out scenarios in your mind on which way the writers could go and what Ben's involvement is going is, is going to be in that? Is he the one that's going to say, guys, we need to eat, we need to survive? Or is he going to be a holdout? No, this is wrong. We can't do that. Uh, how do you see how do you play that out in your mind and how you see the writers taking this? It's a great question. I, to be honest, I, I haven't really thought about it. I haven't thought, I mean, I, I think the cool thing about the show is it gives you these flashes in the very beginning. And so you know kind of where it's going, but it, the, the premise of the show can be stretched out in a way that, you know, that may not end up being until closer to the end of the series, you know, yeah. when we've truly devolved into this, this clan of people who are actually not just eating the people that have died accidentally, but we're, we're hunting each other, you Killing know? I mean, that's, yeah. that's a pretty far, and, I, and, it, and it's funny because I, I you know, I, I paid attention to what people were saying on social media and, and things like that during the first season. And there were a number of people who said, well, where's the, you know, where's the cannibalism and, and why haven't we seen that yet? And if you think about it, I mean, it, to get to where we saw at, at those flashes in the pilot of, you know, people hunting each other and killing each other, that's a pretty far fall yeah. you know i mean that's that's a that's a pretty big you know Leap, devolution yeah. into into just depravity and i think it's going to take us a little while to get there and i think you know the beauty of being able to tell this story over a number of seasons is we we really get to get on into the nuanced psych psyches of these people and how they get there you know it's exactly. not just the end game of let's of let's get to the eating of each other it's like what did these people go through that they would actually consider doing something like this and then and then act on it so I yeah i mean agree. all i know is there's a lot of different there's a lot of different possibilities and and trying to i've learned that trying to wrap my brain around where they're going to go and and how i think about it is yeah. just it's a lost cause yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a futile exercise at this point i kind of just wait until i see what they're doing and then i and then i try to work on that part of great storytelling and character building is to find out why a character does what he did and that's a step-by-step yes. -step process. Usually an event happens that completely reshapes that character and it takes him to a new level. Then another event happens. And I like, like you just said, the writers are going to take this time and they're going to show us how, you know, in 19 months, these girls went from surviving a plane crash to ultimately hunting, killing, and eating each other. I think that's a yep. great element and as an actor on the show, I mean, you must be just really excited to see how they work that out as well. It's it's a dream. It really is. I mean, I think I think as an actor, you you long for material like this. I mean, you, you think about some of the the best series in in the history of TV, right? You think about things like Breaking Bad mm -hmm. and The Sopranos and things like that, where you know the the plot ultimately was secondary, right? What what ultimately happens is kind of secondary to how did they get there. Exactly. And when you put really good writing with with really talented performers it's 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 the most compelling story you could possibly ask for you know to watch these people go through these things and see how they end up where they end up um as as an artist and as an actor i i really couldn't ask for anything more and it's i mean it's exhilarating to be a part of this um it's thrilling to know that they can go in so many different directions and and there's going to be a lot of different things to play to play with and um yeah i mean you don't ask for much more as an actor to be honest absolutely are you surprised by the fan reaction so far like the reddit community alone of yellow jackets <laughs> is about thirty four thousand people that's a lot that's crazy yeah it is i, I i'm surprised I, i'm not surprised that people like the show i think what i was surprised about is just how 
just how detail oriented, you know, there, there's the, um, I forget what, what everybody's calling them, the kind of citizen detectives, you know, the internet yeah. citizen detectives who are kind of, they're like really parsing out every little detail about the show. And part of me even goes back to sometimes when I see stuff like that, I'm like, was that intentional? Did we do that intentionally? Sophie I mean, it's said hard for the me same to even thing. Sophie it's really said, hard for yeah. me to remember sometimes, you know, yeah. like, was that a real thing that we did? Or are they just, you know, are they just looking for clues that aren't there? And yeah. I mean, that's the other fun part of the show. You know, we'll, yeah. we'll find out what was, what was intentional and what was not. And, um, and I think people are having a good time with just kind of coming up with theories and predictions about where this all goes. Are you guys, do you know when you'll be going back to Vancouver to start shooting of season two? <laughs> We haven't gotten our exact dates yet. From from what I hear, it's probably sometime like early summer or so this year. Um, I know they're they're already in the writers' room working on season two, so I think uh, I think they're going to bang out as many scripts as they can, and then um, and then we'll be back in Vancouver hopefully in the next in the next few months to start season two because I know you know they want to get the show back on the air as soon as possible. So you know they're going to have you working in the snow eventually, whether it's season two or three or four. <laughs> yeah, I think you're I think you're right. I think we're all prepared for that. Unfortunately, uh, Stephen, I want to thank you. So- much for coming on here this uh 40 minutes just flew by it's been absolutely phenomenal to talk to you about yellow jackets it's a great show it's a hit show its popularity is just going to continue to grow and i'm so happy for you and the rest of the cast um not only the team cast where you're a part of now the 1994 cast but the 2021 cast i mean talk about all stars there as well oh my gosh you know and it's the the blend of both timelines brought together brilliantly by the crew that makes it such a special show do you have any final thoughts you want to share before we go you know it's funny you brought that up because i i I think that part of what was appealing about this show is just how unique it is And, and i think a lot of us wondered going in you know were they going to be able to make both timelines equally compelling? You know, because I think that's where a show like ours could really fall apart is if one half is really compelling and the other half kind of falls flat. And I mean, I was amazed and, and so happy with the fact that, that both timelines, both storylines really were very compelling. And, and I think people were equally interested in both of them. So um, I expect that to continue. And um, I mean, kudos to our entire cast, uh, and, and our entire writers team and, and, and the whole crew. I mean, it, 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 it was a big show to make. And, uh, and I think everybody's really jazzed and really pumped up to see where we go from here. That leads me to one more question. I mean, yeah. would you be really jazzed up to, you know, get to work with the 2021 timeline crew? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah Julia, I was, uh, Julia, you know, yeah. oh my gosh, we, we didn't, we didn't get to have a whole lot of interaction with them, obviously, because the storylines, you know, the timelines don't really, don't really mix and match. But yeah. um, every time we had a table read and we did it, you know, in a, in a format like this, where it was virtual, it was on Zoom. Um, it was fun to just watch them even in a, even in a table read and, and just learn from, from them because they're all such all stars. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it's such a privilege to be on the same show as as some of these people. So yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Steve. And I want to thank our audience live and those who are going to be watching this later on. Uh, the show is yellow jackets. It's available on showtime. Uh, Whether you have the Showtime app and are a Showtime subscriber or you're a Showtime subscriber to your cable or satellite, it's available. Go. If you haven't watched it yet, it's available for free if you're a subscriber. If you're not, subscribe to Showtime. There's a seven-day free trial where you can binge the whole first season. And then I guarantee you, you'll be keeping that seven days afterwards. So thank you again to Steven Kruger. Again, thank you to all on behalf of both Steven and myself. Stay safe and stay walking. Good night, everybody.